this little thing here is a giant microbe. It is the parasite on which I work, and its eyes are closed because it's asleep. It's actually not really this size. It's a smaller, it's a, it runs alongside the size of a red blood cell, and I'll show you that in a minute. This parasite knows no borders, and so it is over this entire area that's in the hatched marks in South America, in Asia, and in Africa. And Africa is the epicenter of the source of this parasite. Here in the image above me, I'm showing you this parasite swimming around in blood. And that's where it lives, which is extraordinary considering all mammals have active immune systems. And what our immune system is set to do is to recognize things that are foreign and kill them. And we do that very efficiently with this parasite, but this parasite's really smart and it changes its coat. So one day it's purple, the next day it's red, the next week it's pink, the next week it's another color. And so it does that ad infinitum until one day it crosses your blood-brain barrier, you go into a coma, and you sleep. Hence the name sleeping sickness. So we cannot fight this with our own immune system. Our focus for our particular work is on Africa and what we call the Tetsi fly belt. So this is an area that is the size of the United States of America. That's a very big space. And in that space inhabits a fly called the Tetsi fly and it's very efficient at transmitting this parasite. We've been very good about getting drug delivery to people and curing them but it's like taking chemo every time we treat them. So it's not a very nice treatment. But under surveillance and perseverance, we're slowly reducing the amount of human beings that have this disease. But this disease is a zoonosis. And so what I mean by that is every animal in Africa could carry this parasite. And so eradication, you can imagine, is probably not going to happen. Now, they've been around for so long that they can tolerate it. They don't get too sick. But the cattle, which are what the African people need to get out of poverty and to survive, and they just need five, and they like to keep them until they're old, and they use them to plow fields, to carry things, to plow other people's fields, and for milk. Just five cows per family would be wonderful. They cannot tolerate this parasite, and they get very sick, their muscles waste, and then they die. And Red, I've written on this slide that 90% of the land is currently plowed by hand for that very reason. They can't afford tractors, they can't afford the petrol, all they want is some cows. So our mission is to try and alleviate this problem. So all is not completely lost because some primates, you will notice in this slide, actually have the capacity to kill some of these parasites. And so we have, within our blood, a factor that we've coined the word trypanosome lytic factor, TLF. All of us in this room have this, even though you've never probably encountered this wonderful creature. It's in you no matter what, and it's there ready to fight this parasite should you ever go to Africa and get bitten by a tsetse fly. You will notice, however, that the cow is upside down and very dead. And so that is the problem. And it's in this huge area that is occupied by the tsetse fly. And so you'll see the cows and the flies are never in the same space. But people are there, and they need the cattle. So this is the way this wonderful factor, this very good cholesterol, that we all have in our blood works. You've heard of the good cholesterol? Well, I call this the very good cholesterol because it's got a few extra components that give it the capacity to kill this parasite. And the way it works is the parasite is swimming around in blood. I have a schematic up on the left-hand corner. And it has a mouth. It's not really a mouth because it's a single cell, but you can think of it as a mouth. And it takes in the food from our blood in which it swims because it needs to grow. And it's a parasite and it's very lazy and it doesn't make its own stuff. It eats us, eats our food, and that's how it grows. And it has a, like a stomach-like organelle inside of it, 
where it digests all of that food to turn it into building blocks to grow. Well, this is where our wonderful, very good cholesterol comes into action. And we have a little Trojan horse in there, and the name I've written up here for you, but it's for the aficionados in the audience who really want to learn about it. It makes holes in the parasite. And the parasite goes from being that skinny, tiny blob over there to just swelling and swelling and swelling until it bursts like a balloon. So it's a very effective mechanism to kill this parasite. But humans get infected. And that's because this parasite's been around for a very long time and we were killing it very effectively. And then one day a mutation occurred in the parasite that allowed it to be resistant to our really very good cholesterol. And so I show you at the very top a very dead human and a very dead cow because the very same parasite can infect cows. And at the bottom, the animal infected parasites to which we are resistant, but of course the cattle are supremely susceptible. And the picture in Africa shows you the distribution of the human disease. So again, it's the size of the United States of America. But all is not lost. So I'll walk you through this slide, and I haven't actually tested him to see if he's human, so I can't attest <laughs> to whether or not he actually has the very good cholesterol. But assuming that he does, though who knows, the chimpanzee, his closest relative, and you'll notice how they look very similar, actually does not. And we don't know why the chimp lost it, and that's a whole new story. But his next closest rel relative, the gorilla, has a factor that's incredibly identical to his. So these two animals are able to kill the majority of parasites, these parasite, but not all. But the guys up here on the very top, we have a sooty mangabe, a mandrel, and a baboon. When they made their very good cholesterol, they picked a better piece of DNA than we did. And they made a very good cholesterol that kills all of the parasites. So you'll notice here, we've got a very dead mouse lying upside down, the white one. And what we've done, this is what's called a Kaplan-Meier survival curve. We have, and on the, this axis is, are the survivors, and on this axis are the time. And so we challenged these mice with the parasites, and you can see that they all died because they don't have the very good cholesterol, and therefore they have no protection against the parasite. And on the top here, the red at mouse, we gave that mouse a single gene from a baboon. We cloned this gene, we put it into the mouse genome, and we made that mouse completely and utterly resistant to all of the parasites in Africa. So we gave the mouse the capacity to make, as I've shown in the cartoon, the very good cholesterol. Guess what we decided to do? We decided it was time to do something about the cows in Africa. So, with trepidation, I want you to understand that it's pretty bad to be a cow in Africa, and this is the wasting disease as a consequence of being infected with this parasite. And the baboons are having a great time. Look at them, they're taking this tourist car to pieces, and it's like, pff, nothing. And these, everyone's in the same space. So the cows really suffer, and the baboons are totally fine. In evolution, many of the livestock have this family of genes. They look very similar. Unfortunately, they don't have the one that makes a very good cholesterol. And so you can see in the scheme, the only plus sign that exists there is in the human. And of course, now we know it's also in the baboon. So we just wanted to add an extra family member and rescue the cow. Before we did that, we had to clone a cow. And this work has been done in an International Livestock Research Institute in Nairobi, in Kenya. And what they did was they spoke to the farmers and they asked them, which kind of cow would you really like to have to haul your, your goods, to plow your fields, that breeds well, that doesn't eat too much, that makes great milk? And they said, we want a baran. 
So the thir first thing we had to do was actually clone a Boran bull. And the deci decision to do the bull was because we can do artificial insemination. We can sell people the sperm for the same price as any other sperm. And in that way, they can spread the gene very quickly through the population if they so choose. So to clone a Boran bull, it's like Dolly the sheep. And so the man on my side here, Bill Ritchie, actually was instrumental in making Dolly the sheep way back when. And the way you do that is you take the skin cell from an animal, from a young animal, we've now learned, and you pull out the genetic material. And for those of you who may or may not know, there's two copies of genetic material in all of our cells, apart from the cells that make the sperm and the egg. So one copy comes from our mum, and the other copy comes from our dad. So when you take the genetic material out of a skin cell, you have both copies, mum and dad's. They're already in that genetic material. Then we take an egg from a cow, and we pull out the nucleus, or sorry, the genetic material from that egg. And that's only one copy, because it's just mum, right? There's only one copy. And we put the genetic material we took from the skin cell into the egg. And the egg thinks it's just been fertilized by a sperm. So it starts to divide, it makes an embryo, and those embryos we implant into surrogate mums, and we wait to see if they grow and turn into fully adult bulls. And so here we have Tumaini over there. He is now three years old, and he's the very first cloned African Boran in the entire world. And when he was born, the locals were, who took care of him were a little dubious of his capacities to be a bull. Well, Tumaini's done very well. He's made lots of babies, and I want you to notice over here we have 007. Don't ask me why they called that baby 007. I'm very happy they did. And Min Yang here is the one who's really done all of the work. So we've managed to make a cloned animal, and that's the first step towards making an animal that carries the baboon gene. And the reason for that is we cannot introduce that gene into eggs yet. We don't have the technology, at least in cattle, to do that. And so we have to do it the way Dolly the sheep was made. So we have to introduce the DNA into the skin cell, then take all that material out and put it into the egg and make another Tumayini, except we're not going to call him Tumayini. We're going to call him Mzima, which means healthy bull in Swahili. Tumayini means hope in Swahili, because we have hope. And Mazima means healthy bull, because this bull will carry the genetic material that allows it to make the very good cholesterol that all of us in this room have. And we can, through, through artificial insemination, we can distribute his sperm to any farmer who would like to have it. Right now, the way they treat their cattle if they get sick is they give them a pretty nasty drug that's a little like chemo, and they have to treat them once a month. They can't really afford that. It's not a very nice drug. And unfortunately, this little parasite's real smart critter is becoming resistant to the drugs. So this is our aim. These are my cowboys. There's rather a lot of them. They all work really hard towards the same goal, which is generating this healthy bull. And I want to close with one slide, which is from Simon, who's a farmer that I met on one of my trips to Africa, who said to me, Jane, when I get married, can I please have your bull and your cows? Because they'll be really healthy, and my wife will be really happy. So thank you for your time.